Well, uh, thank you for having me here this afternoon. Um, this is something of a homecoming for me because that's Corwin Hall, if that's still the same name, I assume, uh, which was where the politics department was located, and it's where I did my doctoral dissertation. I can't say I have warm memories, <laughs> but I do have memories. Um, and one memory is actually relevant to this afternoon. It may sound irrelevant at the beginning, but you'll get my point in a moment. There was a period when I was doing my dissertation where I was just so tired of reading books and reading more books and reading more books that I think I was verging on and may have crossed into a breakdown. And I discovered or decided at that moment I need to rediscover my peasant roots. I had to return to nature. And the closest thing I could do to returning to nature at Princeton was I decided to join the grounds crew. And the grounds crew, we were the ones who mowed the grass in Princeton. We went around and I got to know the full length and breadth of Princeton, at least its lawns. But there was one problem with working on the grounds crew. The problem was none of the other workers liked mowing grass because they had been doing it for 20 and 30 years. And I was the eager beaver who always wanted to mow the grass. So when it was really hot, humid, scorching, torrid, the moment the supervisor or the foreman was away, they all wanted to hide under the tree to rest and not work. And I would start up my lawnmower because I wanted to mow the grass. But that immediately alerted the foreman to the fact that we were in the area. There was Norman mowing the grass, but where was the rest of the grounds crew? So I earned the eternal hatred and enmity of my co-workers, the eager beaver mower of grass. Now, as it happens, Israel, too, likes to mow the grass or mow the lawn. In 2008, they launched Operation Cast Lead. They wanted, well, let me go back because that's not really a fair beginning. It's very hard to go back to the beginning, but I'll try to keep it within recent history. In 2006, they decided they were going to mow the lawn in Lebanon. They went into Lebanon and in approximately 34 days, they killed 1,200 Lebanese. Of the 1,200, about 1,000 were civilians and they destroyed all of the infrastructure in Lebanon. The bridges, the schools, the airport. Then, a couple of years later, in 2008, 9, Israel decided it wants to mow the grass again. They're eager beavers, like me. They love to mow the grass. They went into Lebanon on December 27, 2008. It lasted about 22 days what Amnesty International called the 22 days of death and destruction. They killed about 1,400 Palestinians. Of those 1,400, up to 1,200 were civilians. One Israeli soldier described this mowing of the grass. He said it was like a child with a magnifying glass burning up ants. Another Israeli soldier described it as a PlayStation computer game. There was barely a single Israeli soldier in Gaza, 
barely a single Israeli soldier in Gaza who even saw a Hamas fighter. There were no engagements in Gaza during 2008-9. There were no battles in Gaza. Israel went in as is its wont, and as the ground troops entered, they blew up everything in sight for a mile's radius ahead of them to make sure there was nobody to fight. So at the end of that massacre in Gaza, there were 13 Israelis killed. Of the 13, three were civilians, 10 were combatants, and out of the 10 combatants, four of the 10 were killed by friendly fire, Israeli soldiers accidentally killing other Israeli soldiers. They leveled everything in Gaza at the time. When Israel left, there were 600,000 tons of rubble left behind. 600,000 tons of rubble. The eager beaver Israelis who loved to mow the grass, they did a fine job in cast lead. But then, after a couple of years, that itch came back. They want to mow the grass. And so in November 2012, they launched another operation. It was called Operation Pillar of Defense. They went into Gaza. This time it wasn't quite so successful, mainly because Egypt under the Muslim Brotherhood and also Turkey under uh, Mr. Erehan, they sent a signal that they weren't going to tolerate another operation cast lead. So this time it was over in about a week. Israel only killed about 180 Palestinians and the operation was over. But now, beginning in June of this past year, about 30, I think it's now 39 days ago, another opportunity arose to mow the grass. And that new opportunity came to be called Operation Protective Edge. There's been so much nonsense said about what happened during the last 39 days that one really barely knows where to begin. And now is not the occasion or the opportunity to go through the whole of the factual record. But I want to just say a couple of things about what happened and then come to what I think is the most important point, not so much our responsibility, because I refuse to accept responsibility for what happened, uh, but the responsibility of our government for what happened. And that's where I'll leave off after I just briefly go through the record. Now, we're constantly told that this latest operation, this latest mowing of the grass, Incidentally, for those of you who aren't aware, that's not my expression, it's not my coinage, it's the Israeli coinage. They like to call it, we, every once in a while they say we have to go in and mow the grass. That's their expression, not mine. So, what happened? We're told it all started when these three Israeli teenagers were abducted and then it was found later, it was said later, that they were dead. Is that how the whole thing started? It's just not true. It all started at the end of April of this past year, when the Palestinian main factions, Hamas and Fatah, they signed a unity agreement, and they formed a unity government. And this enraged Prime Minister Netanyahu. Mr. Netanyahu doesn't like to be ignored. He likes to be listened to. So Mr. Netanyahu had been saying Iran is a new Hitler. They're threatening a new 
Holocaust, but the United States and the EU ignored Mr. Netanyahu and entered into negotiations with Iran. This annoyed Mr. Netanyahu. And then this unity government was formed and it included a terrorist organization according to Mr. Netanyahu. And what enraged him then was that both the United States and the EU said, we're going to continue negotiating with this government. We'll have a wait and see approach. Well, this enraged Mr. Netanyahu even more. Why aren't they listening to me? Why don't they see these people are terrorists? Isn't it obvious that they're terrorists? Well, obviously, it's not obvious. So we're going to have to show them that Hamas is a terrorist organization. We're going to have to prove it to them. And then an opportunity dropped into Mr. Netanyahu's lap. And the opportunity was the abduction of the three Israeli teenagers and then their subsequent killing. Mr. Netanyahu decided, even though he almost certainly knew two facts. Number one, he knew that the Hamas leadership had nothing to do with the kidnappings. And he knew, number two, that the kids were almost certainly dead moments after they were, or killed moments after the kidnapping. But here was an opportunity. Here was an occasion that he wouldn't let pass. So, pretending to be on a rescue operation, he sent in the Israeli forces into the West Bank, where they killed between six and ten Palestinians, detonated two homes, ransacked businesses, ransacked homes, arrested 600 Palestinians, of whom about 150 were put under administrative detention, meaning no charges, no trial. And he did everything he could to keep hitting them, keep hitting them, keep hitting them, until they finally react, until there's a violent reaction. So then he could say, you see, we told you, they're terrorists. And exactly as you might expect, exactly what was predictable, he kept hitting them and hitting them until finally some factions in, in, the, in Gaza started to shoot projectiles. Hamas held back, it held back, it then began to escalate, and it then spun out of control, which is what ex exactly what Mr. Netanyahu wanted. As he said later to one member of the U.S. administration, quote, never second guess me again, which is to say, I told you they were terrorists, and wasn't I right? But then he had a problem. The problem was he couldn't stop the projectile attacks. And if he couldn't stop the projectile attacks, he couldn't claim victory. The only way you can stop these projectile attacks is through a ground invasion. That's the only option. You cannot prevent them through aerial bombardments. But he was worried. If you launch a ground invasion, there probably will be a lot of civilian, excuse me, a lot of combatant casualties. A lot of Israeli soldiers will get killed. But Israeli society does not tolerate a lot of combatant casualties. The only other option is you go in, you blast everything in sight, like during Operation Cast Lead in 2008-9, you blast everything in sight. That prevents combatant casualties, but the international community had signaled we're not going to accept another Cast Lead. You went too far in 2008-9, we're not going to let you repeat it. So if you remember in the first few days of this Operation Cast Lead, 
excuse me, Operation Protective Edge, Netanyahu held back, he held back, he held back on that ground invasion. What is he to do? But then two new gifts dropped into his lap. The first gift was the vampire Tony Blair. Tony Blair conjured this very, very clever, he conjured this very clever ceasefire proposal. And the ceasefire proposal was, we'll have a ceasefire and we'll lift the blockade of Gaza when, we'll lift the blockade of Gaza when the security situation stabilizes in Gaza. That was the key condition. The security situation in Gaza had to stabilize. The problem was, if Israel says Hamas is a terrorist organization, which it does, the security situation in Gaza won't stabilize until Hamas either surrenders or it's defeated. So, of course, Hamas had to reject that ceasefire proposal. And the moment it rejected it and Israel accepted it, now Netanyahu had a moral alibi. He could say to the world, you see, we accept the ceasefire. Hamas rejects it. We have no choice. We have to go into Gaza. The second gift that dropped into Netanyahu's lap was the downing of the Malaysian airliner. Now politics is about taking advantage of situations as they arise unexpectedly. For those of you who go back a ways, during the first intifada in 1989, right as the intifada was unfolding, and it gave Israel a very hard time, that first intifada, exactly at that moment, the Tiananmen massacre occurs in China. And Netanyahu at the time, he gave a speech at Bar Ilan University, and he famously said, Israel's big mistake was when all the cameras were riveted on the Tiananmen massacre, we should have used that moment to carry out a mass expulsion in the West Bank. And now, with the downing of the Malaysian airliner and all the cameras now focusing on what happened, Gaza drops down to the second or third story in the news. It's Netanyahu's Tiananmen moment. He now uses that moment to go into Gaza. Now, what happened in the next couple of or three weeks was perfectly obvious to everyone. Israel said it had what's called, I hate the technical military jargon because it's so pathological, so sick, but they call it their bank of targets. That means in advance the places they want to target in Gaza. And they said after two or three days we had exhausted our bank of targets. And so after two or three days, it just came to outright terror assaults on Gaza. The targeting of the schools, the targeting of the mosques, the targeting of the hospitals, the targeting of the ambulances. It was outright terror assaults on Gaza obvious to the lay person's eye. At the beginning, even reputable human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch were very reluctant to accuse Israel of war crimes, even if the findings of these organizations showed they were committing war crimes. But then it became impossible to ignore 
And the human rights organizations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, they start coming out with quite strong statements saying Israel is apparently committing massive war crimes in Gaza. Now, that brings me to the end, and in fact, the beginning, the middle, and the end. Because that brings me back to the United States. I'm not into, even though I'm a person of the left, I was, I am, I will be, that's my politics, I'm not into cheap rhetoric. It's just, I'm not into sloganeering, it's not my cup of tea. However, having said that, having said that, there is simply no question whatsoever that President Barack Obama was the chief enabler or the enabler in chief of this massacre. Now, wait, wait. There are people who will be watching this on camera and they'll say, oh, okay, that's just another leftist bashing Obama. So, I'm going to ask you, I have two more minutes, I'm going to ask you to look at the facts and decide for yourself. Every day that Israel was committing these massive atrocities in Gaza, each day that these atrocities were being committed, and as I said, after a week, they were being copiously and carefully documented by the major human rights organizations. Each day, what did Barack Obama and his spokespersons do? They just came out each day with that insipid bromide, Israel has the right to defend itself. Israel has the right to defend itself. Israel has the right to defend itself. In the face of all the human rights organizations documenting that they're targeting civilians, targeting civilian structures, there are no Hamas militants in vicinity. All he said was, or his spokespersons, he just kept saying, Israel has the right to defend itself. Each time he said that, he was sending Israel the green light to continue the massacre. That was the message he was sending. Now, some of you might say, unfair. Did he really have any control over this lunatic state? Well, yes, it is a lunatic state, but it hasn't lost complete control of its senses. That's not true. It's a psychopathic state, and psychopaths have rational moments. So, what happened? Look yourself at the record. It's not my rhetoric. Look at the record. Israel bombs one UN school that's used as a shelter. It then hits another UN school used as a shelter. It then hits a third UN school as a used as a shelter. Then a fourth, and then the fifth. By the time we reach the fifth, the internal UN structure is reaching a boiling point. Ban Ki-moon, wake up. You comatose puppet of the United States, wake up. And finally, miracle of miracles, like Christ rising from the dead, Ban Ki-moon says, this is a criminal act. Can you believe it? Ban Ki-moon is now calling Israel's actions criminal. And so Obama is now isolated on the world stage. He's looking ridiculous. He's looking absurd. And so finally, when the fifth school was hit on August 3rd, 
when Ban Ki-moon called it criminal and Mr. Obama realized he had even lost control of his puppet, finally the State Department called it a disgraceful act, a terrible act, and then what, what happened? Go back and look. The very same day that the U.S. State Department, the Obama administration said something, Netanyahu announced it's over. The ground invasion is over. We're withdrawing. Anybody who has an ounce of gray matter upstairs, which excludes many of the people in that building, <laughs> anyone who has an ounce of gray matter upstairs can see cause and effect. The moment the U.S. said it's gone too far, you've crossed a red line, at that moment the operation was over. So Netanyahu, even if he is a maniac, unfortunately he is, he hasn't gone completely over the cliff. He understands when you cross that red line with the United States, then you have to do what the, ma excuse me, what the master tells you. And it was over. The last thing I want to just say is, um, it's impossible to predict at this point how it's going to end. Uh, it's pretty much a stalemate now. Uh, I'm afraid that it's going to end ba uh, badly for uh, the people of Gaza. I could be mistaken. Uh, but whichever way it ends, uh, if Israel didn't completely get its way, it really is because of the heroic, the honorable, the dignified, the indomitable, the indomitable people of Gaza. It's a, it's, it's a real, it's a sight to behold. I was only in Gaza once after the blockade. Uh, I was there after Operation Cast Lead. And the thing that struck me most about the people of Gaza, we went around, saw all the death, all the destruction. Uh, what struck you about the people of Gaza was absolutely nobody complained. It was just like, okay, this is what needs to be done. They're looking ahead. They don't wear their suffering on their shoulder. They don't complain. We're just going to move on. And they remind me, if I can leave you with one last image, uh, there is a film from the 1930s, which probably nobody in this place has ever seen. It's a cult kind of film. It's called Freaks. Who's seen Freaks? Raise your hand. Oh, great. This is a very culturally enlightened group. Uh, and Freaks is about a circus. And in the circus, there are the freaks, the ones who have misshapen bodies born with all of these defects and they're constantly ridiculed, humiliated, degraded by the circus owner, normal people. And one night the freaks, it's the last scene, there's the thunder, the lightning, and you see the distance, and rising from the ground are all the freaks. And they're slowly, step by step, approaching the circus owners, the normal people. And obviously those freaks, they were the metaphor for the wretched of the earth, the ones who have no rights, the ones who are treated like garbage, who are treated like dead grass. And I think of the people of Gaza like those freaks, the ones who have so much more dignity, so determined that come what may, they're going to win their rights or die trying to. I don't 
recommend to anyone to give their life because I've lived a very privileged existence and I don't know how I would react if faced with the prospect of liberty or death. But I have no doubt that our first moral obligation is to support those people who are willing to make the sacrifice, willing to give their life, willing to have all of that death and destruction visited on them because they refuse to live the life of freaks. They refuse to be <laughs> degraded. They refuse to be humiliated. They refuse to be stepped on. And they refuse to be told that they're not worth more than dead grass. So, in praise, in honor, in everything I'm capable of, to the great, wonderful people of Gaza. Thank you. <laughs>